The 2016 presidential election was one of the most contentious in history. The first female president of a major party up against a businessman with no public office experience. We all know the results. We'll review the election and much more coming up on In Focus, Donald Trump's White House. Hello and welcome to a special collaborative show between MATC and UWM. In Focus, Donald Trump's White House. I'm Emily Gallagher-Schmitz. And I'm Jordan Gazarowski. The first three months have been co quite controversial with Trump as president. A lot has happened such as the travel ban, a request for a wall between the Mexican border and the United States, and comments about fake news in the media. Today we'll be looking back on the president's time in office thus far, but we begin at the beginning, election night. For that, let's over, head over to Naomi Wilson. Thanks, Jordan and Emily. Many people have strong memories of November 8, 2016, no matter which candidate they supported. We have reports from both election night watch parties. Maggie Polzine was with Hillary Clinton supporters, and Ian Holtz was with backers of Donald Trump. Maggie will kick us off. Camaraderie. Excitement. This was the atmosphere during the first half of the night at the Democratic Party of Milwaukee County's election watch party. Supporters were all over J&B's Blue Ribbon Bar and Grill, but they started to get anxious as the night went on. This election is way too close for my comfort zone. I didn't expect it to be this close. I thought she was going to be a blowout, actually. And I believed a lot of the polls that said she had a 90% chance of winning. Now, it's like way too close for comfort for me. So I'm kind of nervous, but I'm still very hopeful. Supporters were huddled together watching the TVs and talking about their experiences during the election season. Party chair Robert Hansen shared with us his favorite part of the election. I think uh, just hearing different people's stories about why they're involved, um, different experiences they've had in their lives that have caused them to, to get get behind a candidate like Hillary Clinton and seeing some of the, the hope in, in so many people's eyes as the campaign went on. Around 11 p.m., the room became quieter as Clinton lost crucial swing states and the reality started to set in that she would not become Madam President. Donald Trump would become the president-elect. I think that uh, people will, I think that people who voted for him may have buyer's remorse. I think that they voted kind of like in that, you know, the Brexit, Brexit vote where people didn't even know what they were voting for and they were just voting to be angry and they were voting to, to have a change. I think they'll, you know, four years from now we'll have a, another chance to maybe right this wrong. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know if it'll, I don't know, I don't know if it'll do anything that will completely damage anything. I, I, with a Republican Congress and a Republican president, anything's possible. If you can see here behind me, it's dwindled significantly throughout the night, starting from probably over 100 people to less than 50 now. Uh, the Democratic Party has taken a huge morale hit, but they're still here, they're still fighting strong, and they're hoping Clinton comes out on top. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Maggie Polsine. The night started slow at the Milwaukee Athletic Club, but the mood changed quickly as Donald Trump began to pick up states. Supporters gathered nervously around TVs to watch the returns come in. State Representative Dan Canoto was a little more optimistic about the Today, results. Today, when those Republicans went to the polls that weren't sure, had some concern about Donald Trump, I think they came home to the party and voted Republican. And then state? after state, after state, went red. The party's host, Chris Slinker, is confident that Donald Trump will help business. I actually think he'll be easier to work with when it comes to issues related to business. 
And I think that's great. As a businessman, that matters to me. And I think he will find a way. Once the election simmers down and all the hatred and all the negativity goes away, he could be much more of a mainstream Republican that Democrats, I think, will, uh, would like sitting at the table with. A few hours later, at 1.30, he exhaustively called the race. Trump's victory might take a while for Milwaukeeans to get used to. We are here to show that we matter. We are here to show that we are fighting the powers. We are here to show that we are fighting the 1%. Yeah. It's been two days since the election, and protests like this are breaking out across the country. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Ian Holtz. Thank you both for those reports. Now back over to Jordan, who has a special guest. I'm joined live by Jesse Garcia, who teaches at UWM. We wanted to ask her a few more questions about election night and Trump's overall victory. Hi, Jesse. Thank you for braving the storm and for <laughs> being able to make it on the show. My pleasure, Jordan. So um, let me ask you this. So what's your opinion on your students' coverage during the 2016 presidential election? Well, okay, I'm a little biased, but I thought they just did a fabulous job. And we started covering this before the election, talking with students. And then, as you saw just there, the, the two election night parties, and of course, making sure that you cover both sides equally. And then, as people will see coming up in this next hour, we started to explore the whys of the victory. So why and how did Trump win when so many pollsters had predicted that Hillary Clinton would win? What happened? Where, how did people get it wrong? So we traveled to you know rural Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa. Those are all coming up and, and talk to people about that too and really carried our coverage you know ever since election night and before we've carried it all the way through and continue to this day and okay transitioning off of that you did take a trip to the Mississippi River uh -huh. Valley and uh, you took some of your students mm -hmm. and um, please tell me like like, how did you get that idea to actually go to the Mississippi River Valley <laughs> funny I actually woke up with the idea in my head one morning and thought the rural vote, you know, we need to find out how Trump won the rural vote uh, in these areas. And I approached a couple of fellow professors at UWM and Jessica McBride and I, uh, who she's a former investigative reporter, just dove right in. And it was fascinating to watch her work because she was calling all these election commissions and gathering all this information and finding all these maps of, you know, that showed the different poverty levels and things too compared to uh, the way people voted. And we floated it out to our students on a Monday or Tuesday, and the trip was that weekend. We had 18 students, I think, sign up. And so we took this huge contingent of students on this road trip. It was great immersive reporting. So what did you find? Wow, um, it was really interesting. I would say there were a number of different um, things there. The main thing was economics. Most of the people we talked to said jobs are hard to come by. Uh, wages are down, you know, people have to work multiple jobs, and they said we gave Barack Obama eight years, nothing really changed. A lot of people were um, offended if you, you know, by the racism thoughts or that they were voting for Trump because of those reasons. They said we're not racist, we voted for Barack Obama twice, but nothing changed, and we wanted to see change. We thought maybe a businessman would help. So that was one. Obamacare was another big one. And really distrust of Hillary Clinton. There was a lot of distrust of Hillary Clinton. Some people told us the FBI investigation in that final week was like the final tipping point of the scale for them. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Jesse, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Now let's head over to Emily for more reactions, reactions to Trump's victory. It certainly was a stunning victory in many senses, as most pundits and pollsters had it wrong. The morning after presidential election, Two reporters, Jenna Gadosh and Ben Slowey, went to UWM Union to speak with students about the results. Here's what they found. What do you think happened last night? Do you support what went on, and how do you feel about it? Uh, I have no problem with it. I voted for Trump, so I mean, I didn't really expect him to win because I kind of figured that Hillary would. But so it was kind of like it was really cool to watch. Just like everything turned red. So that was just my thoughts. Like I stayed up like all night watching it. So it was it was, it was interesting. Um, I don't know. I was just kind of disappointed. I guess how most people feel right now. It's a lot to take in. Uh, pretty upset. Yeah. I um, you know, I voted for Hillary, and you know, uh, when I was over at the library, they said post something nice, you know, on the the board there. Somebody said something about somebody losing or whatever, and I was so tempted to write hate Trump's love, but I thought, you know what, then you feed into all his negativism. So, I don't know. We'll have to see what the next four years has in store. Well, I think it's uh, very surprising, no doubt, having like the Great Lakes states being really big sway 
uh, especially Wisconsin being highly democratic in its major density counties. So it's kind of like uh, saddening in a way that it swayed uh, in majority favor Trump. I woke up feeling pretty heartbroken. Um, I work in a school um, where most of the kids are Latino and black students, um, and most of them are undocumented. So going to work today um, to explain to them what happened is going to be so hard. Um, and to try to calm them down, um, I've already heard that it's pretty pretty tough there so I think I'm really thinking about them um, and just any way that I can help them um, I will continue to fight for them and their rights no matter what. Jenna and Ben we appreciate your reporting although he won the presidency through the Electoral College he did not take the popular vote however the path to the White House is set by electoral votes in this week's following the week in the weeks following the victory Trump embarked on a thank you tour hitting states that were key to his electoral college success he returned to Wisconsin in November as the Badger state played a key role in electing Trump the presidential nominee traveled to West Allis a suburb of Milwaukee to express gratitude to the voters for their support and the successful campaign Matthew Musa was there it is my high Introduce to all of you across the great state of Wisconsin the president elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. A passionate group of Donald Trump supporters, along with nearly 100 members of national and local media, packed the Wisconsin State Fair Exposition Center Tuesday in West Allis for the president-elect's thank you tour, just one day after the Wisconsin State recount was completed. Ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump has won the state of Wisconsin. Trump told the crowd that he still plans to build a big, big wall, fix Obamacare, cut taxes, defeat ISIS, and also work on job creation. He also addressed environmental restrictions. I will cancel the restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale, oil, natural gas, and clean, beautiful coal. We're going to put our miners back to work. One rally goer who had attended four previous Trump rallies before the election found today's event particularly inspiring. Just looking back and seeing, you know, standing room only, everybody's packed in here all the way to the back and everything. It, it was just a humongous crowd. Lots of energy and lots of passion. We can, you know, look around the country and our communities and everywhere and we just see, you know, problems that need to be fixed, change that is wanted, and you know, everybody in here reflected that, and that is why Donald Trump is our, our president-elect. Trump's thank you tour will visit key swing states Pennsylvania on Thursday and Florida on Friday before wrapping up in Alabama on Saturday. And as you can see from the empty podium behind me, Donald Trump has left the building. Sources say that a couple thousand people came out for tonight's event here in Wisconsin. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Matthew Musa. Thank you, Matthew. Let's dig a little deeper into how Trump won this election. For that, we go back to Jordan at the main desk. One of the big surprises of this election was the incredible turnout of rural voters for Trump, many of whom had gone for Democrats in the past. In fact, up and down the Mississippi River Valley, many cities and towns slipped in favor of Trump. We sent reporters to three states along the Mississippi to discover why voters in rural areas overwhelmingly voted Republican. Let's begin in Wisconsin. Rural areas of the state saw some of the biggest shifts that led to the Badger State switch from blue to red. Steven Stoyanovich and Jenna Gadish went to Prairie Duchene to find out why. Hi, I'm Jenna Gadish. And I'm Steven Stoyanovich, and we're here in Prairie Duchene, Wisconsin, a city that has about 6,000 people living in it. It's also in Crawford County, which is one of the counties that flipped from being blue in 2012 to red in 2016. Now, we spoke to both sides of people supporting Clinton and Trump, but we're going to kick it off with a man who led us into his home. Ted Finn has lived in Prairie du Chien for almost 50 years. Born Republican, Ted decided to vote Democratic in the last three elections. I voted for Hillary. 
she was the second best from Bernie. Despite their differences, Ted invited a Republican voter into his home. The atmosphere remained friendly even though the outcome was against his favor. But Hillary was my second choice, obviously, because, well, number one, I would never vote for someone like Trump. Many felt this election came down to the silent majority and faulty prognosticating. I asked my husband and various other people what they thought about the polls because, frankly, no one I know talks to a pollster. I don't talk to pollsters, no one I know talks to pollsters, so it's like, where are they getting their information? Mm -hmm. And so, can you trust the polls? Well, obviously you can't. A lot of the voting was populist voting. I have a niece who voted for uh, Bernie Sanders and she refused to vote. Trump yeah, promised to make Trump America Trump. great again, oh, wow. so therefore they would have something like uh, of the past. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was heavily an economic reason. And on the streets of the river town, there were some common themes. In this area, it's hard for people to find good jobs. We really lack that here. Mm -hmm. um, good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. A lot of people work a lot of part-time jobs because um, people can't get full-time mm -hmm. because a lot of places just hire part-time. Willing to give Trump a chance, Litke is optimistic. Well, I'm hoping that he is able to um, bring a lot of jobs back into this country, a lot of good paying jobs. Um, that it's hard to make a living on nine, ten dollars an hour. And especially right here, you know, in this area, if you get a nine, ten dollar an hour job, that's a pretty good job. So it's, we, that's what we need. We also found Trump supporters. Some think the reason the county flipped might have been foreshadowed by the Scott Walker recall election of 2012, when Walker retained his seat following a battle with unions. Well, if you'd been here for the recall, you weren't shocked. You had seen this before the night of the recall election. You saw that Republican, I guess the first waves come up on the beach and then the tidal wave hit November 8th. Take a look at this map from CNBC. Trump took Crawford County 50% to 45% over Hillary Clinton, and the county flipped by 25 points from 2012. I was kind of surprised that it changed too. I know a lot of my friends were thinking Hillary, you know, two months ago. And I don't know if it's just because of the scandals that came out or if we just are more worried, you know, as time got closer and, and people decided to go for Trump. This map from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows the average weekly wages in Wisconsin by county. Crawford is here, and it falls in the lowest category of less than $649. He listened to the working class people, and I think he touched a nerve with them. And for so many years, the... Uh, Average public person didn't think that our representatives in, in D.C. were listening to them at all, so I think he gave them a voice. Now we found that some people did not want to share their opinion about the election and actually found some business owners thought that it would be bad for their business. And jobs seems to be the major issue here in uh, Prairie du Chien and the area. And an even bigger question is, is this change just for a little while, or can we expect Crawford County to go red again? For Media Milwaukee, I'm Jenna Gatish. And I'm Stan Stoyanovich. Thank you, Stephen and Jenna. Another state that went for Trump was Iowa. So we drove across the mighty Mississippi to find voters in rural areas there. Why did they flip? If they didn't, what did they think of the friends and neighbors who did? We found a quiet river town along the banks of the Mississippi and started asking people for their opinions. Jamie Anderson reports. Across the Mississippi River from Wisconsin, you'll find McGregor and Marquette, Iowa, another area that switched from blue to red in the 2016 election. Some voters in Iowa felt that things have been stagnant and want change. I felt that uh, they've had it long enough on the Democratic side because um, they really haven't done much since they've been having that in their control. And I think that the Republicans can put everything in the right motion, in the forward motion. One of the things that I've heard is that a lot of the people were excited to have a woman president. To me, that was not the thing to go for, just to have a woman president. I think a lot of people in this area probably didn't think that they were being heard. Um, and he has like the working class type of questions and stuff would be important in this area. One man who told us neither candidate was worthy of his vote. 
shared a warning for the future. Well, if you've studied history, let's just hope he doesn't do what happened in 1939. And I don't know, that's Adolf Hitler. He very similar. Let's just hope it don't go to that extent. From caucuses to being a swing state, Iowa played a very important role in the 2016 election. From Media Milwaukee, I'm Jamie Anderson. Thank you, Jamie. Southern Minnesota had many counties flip to Trump after voting Democratic in the past. Our reporters found voters on both sides at a bingo night and then zeroed in on one of those small business owners. She, sh she shared her opinion while showing us around the hotel she owns. Here are both of those reports, beginning with Ian Holtz at Bingo Night in Mabel, Minnesota. I'm here in Mabel, Minnesota, a town so quaint, it still has an operating telephone booth. On some Saturdays, residents gather for bingo at the local school. This is Mabel Canton High School. The senior class has 29 students, and on this night, Mabel residents were here to win turkey. The big winner was this girl, who took home $112. That's a lot of money in Mabel, where residents are struggling financially. Perhaps that's one reason the county flipped to Trump. The farmers, Mike, I come from a family of farmers. They're taking a hit. When they take a hit, the rest of the small businesses in the area take a hit. So we're not, no one's making as much money, it's getting harder to pay for things, and the cost of living just keeps going up while we keep making less in this area. We've had so many people who, you know, more than half of their paychecks are going to insurance with high deductibles that they can't even use the insurance for, I know ourselves included. Um, it's just really financially difficult. A lot of the people were just fed up with politicians and they wanted somebody who wasn't a politician, kind of like when they elected Ventura in Minnesota years ago. People just said, hey, we've had enough of the politicians. Let's get somebody in there that's like us. And I think that's why they voted for Trump, because he's not a politician. There are a lot of very, very wonderful people here, and I really do enjoy living here. But there's also a lot of frustration here, and it's misaimed. And there was a lot of really bad social media misinformation that people were quoting as gospel. Nobody bothered to actually look at the facts. They said, oh, look at this meme, it's real. One thing about this community is despite their political beliefs, they do help each other out. This bingo net was to raise money for the cross country team. In Mabel, Minnesota, I'm Ian Holt. In Mabel, Minnesota, you'll find the state's oldest functioning hotel, run by Crystal Atkins. Should we whistle while we work? <laughs> <laughs> who is also a full-time zoning administrator for Fillmore County. Crystal is another voter who switched to Donald Trump after voting for Barack Obama in her first two elections. With Fillmore County being such an agricultural, rural community, we have a lot, I have a lot of friends that are self-employed. They're farmers. They, they don't have... Um, day jobs, they don't work eight to five in an office, so they're all purchasing their own health insurance. And when I see what the Affordable Care Act has done for these people, there isn't a soul in the county that, that thinks it's affordable. But, you know, those were all things that factored into it. But um, the, the other thing about Fillmore County is there's a lot of hunters, there's a lot of strong Second Amendment folks. And I'm sick of hearing, oh, we've got to tighten up the, we've got to tighten up the regulations for purchasing firearms. Although she knew of some people in town who voted for Hillary Clinton, Crystal didn't think Clinton had what it took. I have lots of friends that, oh, they want to see the first woman president, and I want to barf on my own shoes because, with all due respect to recording, a vagina is not a qualification for being a president. As an example of how divided the town is, I'm across the street from Crystal's hotel right now, and this antique shop clearly supported Clinton Kane in the election. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Jamie Anderson. Thank you, Jamie and Ian. Another big piece to the puzzle in this election was the inner city vote. Emily has more on how Milwaukee voted. Emily? Voters turnout in the city was at a low during the 2016 election. Many voters simply chose to stay home. Reporter Gabrielle
Bear EA went to the north side Milwaukee where the population predominant, is predominantly African American to talk to WNOV radio host Sherwin Hughes about some of the reasons why people would not exercise the right to vote in an important election. Quiet guys. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Today is Friday, December 2nd, 2006. Sherwin Hughes hosts his radio show, The Forum, on WNOV 860 AM, The Voice, Monday through Friday, 9 AM to 12 PM. The Forum is a political talk show directed towards Milwaukee's urban community. For this year's presidential election, the inner city vote declined by nearly 20% from 2012, and Hughes has some ideas as to why. I don't think the motivation was there with Barack Obama not being on the ballot and Hillary Clinton not visiting the state of Wisconsin at all between the primary, which she lost in April, and November. I think it didn't give black voters enough of a reason because they didn't see her, they didn't talk to her. There was no eye contact with the voters. Now, she's not President Barack Obama, but she had to at least make an appeal to folks that did vote for Obama if she wanted to get their support. Without a visit from Hillary Clinton during her campaign, the urban community did not feel as connected with the Democratic nominee. With President Obama, it was just very obvious, but also he was, he was more tangible. He came here a lot. He came here a lot in 2004. He was here for Russ Feingold in 04 before, before he was an even a presidential candidate. He was here in 07 in 2008. He was here an awful lot in 2012. And so people came to expect their Democratic nominee to be in this battleground state a lot, and she just was the opposite of that, and so it made people really question what the other side was saying about her because she was not able to defend herself in person, and I think it ultimately hurt her. People voted on that. It's always been successful in American politics. But although the state of Wisconsin and the nation yes, went Republican for this presidential election, Hughes remains no positive about the future. Right the, split. the reactions are mixed. They are extreme. They are sometimes benign. People think, well, we'll be just fine. How bad could it possibly be? Remember, the African-American community has lived through an awful lot of presidents and a lot of different changes in American history, so I'd have to say the majority of folks are going to be A-OK, -okay, and that's what the conversations are based around. WNLV 860 AM The Voice. Keep it locked. I'll be right back. It's a mystery as to what will happen within the next four years, but we can only hope for more active voting in future elections. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Gabrielle Berrier. Thank you, Gabrielle. Across the street from WNOV, you'll find Mr. Perkins Family Restaurant, a popular hangout for eggs and coffee in the city. Reporter Jordan Garcia visited Mr. Perkins not for breakfast, but to hear more opinions on the election and on the new president. He had no trouble finding people with an opinion. Here's Jordan's report. Mr. Perkins Family Restaurant on Capitol and 20th is a good place to get a finger on the pulse of the black community. We asked a few people about their views on the election and how the community is reacting to the results. I think maybe a part of the black vote took it for granted that Hillary was going to win in light of all the bad, negative things that Trump said. They thought it was, I think they thought it was a wash. Well, I think maybe some are shocked, but going to have to give him a chance. He's in now, so, you know, see what he does is for his 100 days. I mean, he's already backed off a lot of things that he said that he was going to do, so maybe there's hope. Are you going to also give me a half mile? And then give me an extra Polish, too. And I want the lemonade and uh, fruit punch mix. Okay. Too many of us have been too uh, skeptical about whether or not our votes count, whether or not um, our, our votes will make a difference. Um, or just fear, or lack of knowledge, all of that. So I think a lot of that had a lot to do with why it didn't turn out. I think people just have to keep talking about it. Uh, as, as children turn 18, people have got to help them understand because they are kids. And if their household hasn't been teaching them that, they need to start, you know, just teach them about the importance. It's not that hard to go vote. You get up, you get out, you go do it, you leave, you put the sticker on, you feel, like you've made a contribution to your community, and you have. Everyone we talked to voted for Hillary Clinton, but one man emphatically supported Donald Trump. You no, know, the truth is that Donald Trump ain't gonna be, ain't really gonna do no no difference, but he can make some type of impre uh, pressing and improvement. That's how I feel. A lot of them ain't gonna like what I say. A lot of them ain't gonna like the truth. Everybody run from it, you know. But that is the truth, and that's why I voted Donald Trump. 
Barack didn't do nothing. He didn't raise up minimum wage. He's done nothing for black folks besides uh, the Obamacare. Everybody know that. But no changes occur. We're talking about everybody still on the corner selling dope. Everybody's still robbed. You're, giving, you, you're not giving the community nothing, especially in poverty. We're, we're not, we're not uh, rising in numbers. Everybody dying, going to jail. No matter how Donald Trump handles the next four years, Mr. Perkins Family Restaurant will still be a staple in the black community, and we'll all still pay our taxes and go to work. For Meet in Milwaukee, I'm Jordan Garcia. Thank you, Jordan. Another place to find opinions is a local barber shop. Everyone was talking about the election in the days and weeks after Trump's victory. We, sat, we sent reporter Katrina Vergara to G's Clippers near downtown Milwaukee to talk to him with employees and customers. How were they feeling about the new president and did they vote? Katarina filed this report. 2016 election, there were many who struggled to pick a candidate, but also many who didn't vote at all. The biggest trap was in Milwaukee's District 15, where voter turnout declined by about 19.5% in comparison to 2012. I think a lot of people in the African American community, and just in the Midwest in general, we like to see, touch, and feel things. And Hillary Clinton really didn't come to our state very much. Donald Trump, on the other hand, he was here quite often. And a lot of times people vote with what they see. And then you have the other majority that they didn't know which way to turn, so they didn't turn out at all. I think because of the, the lack of interest in the two candidates. That's the best explanation I can give you. Um, they didn't, I feel like the candidates didn't spark enough interest amongst the voters, so they just stayed home. Uh, this election compared to the last was very, I guess, had more social approach, but less of a presidential approach. It's not traditional no more. What does that mean? Um, it's, it really showed me anybody can be president nowadays. I don't remember who I voted for. It, wouldn't, it wasn't Hillary or Trump. Okay. <laughs> We do suffer some of the effects from our president, but more so than anything, we need to show up on the local level and vote on the local level for people to represent us when they get to in the state legislature as well as the Senate, as well as in our Wisconsin legislature. That's where the overall change will be made, where we can make a difference here in our community for ourselves. We have to show up on our own local, le local level before we can really make a change on our national level. It's not just Milwaukee, it's the state of Wisconsin as a whole. The voter turnout this election was the lowest it's been in the past 16 years. At G's Clippers in Milwaukee, I'm Katarina Vergara. Now back over to Naomi, who's joined by Amanda Becker, who also reported on the election, with Gabby. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you covered a story at WNOV Radio, and you also covered a story at Mr. Perkins. Why did you go to Mr. Perkins in order to reach inner city voters? Um, well, it was uh, our professor's idea. and. It, the inner city just kind of seemed like the next logical step. Uh, they went all over Wisconsin and the Midwest, and so it seemed like we needed to hear that side of the story as well. And we heard a lot of great opinions, as you just saw. Mm -hmm. And Sharon Hughes of WNLV mentioned that um, Hillary Clinton didn't show up enough in Milwaukee. Um, why do you think that many black voters decided not to vote for Hillary, um, given that she didn't come as much? Yeah, I think uh, presence is taken for granted. Uh, you definitely have to come and show voters, and you have to gain the vote. You, um, it's not just expected to give it, uh, be given to you just because um, we don't like what Trump says doesn't mean we're going to vote for you. And I think she took that for granted and kind of thought it was a wash, and it wasn't. I agree. Um, so why a lot of people were saying um, in the G's Clippers uh, story that uh, we need to vote locally and things like that, and we need to be more involved. However, um, Ron Johnson has won twice, and despite Bernie Sanders' uh, history with fighting for civil rights in the black community, uh, he still lost the primary. So uh, what do you think Democrats need to do in order to really reach inner city voters? Yeah, I think um, presence still, uh, so. it's very important. Even between communities, we need to get out and be part of other communities, go to local coffee shops, uh, somewhere out of our comfort zone or where you might meet new people um, from different communities because it's important um, that we all come together and communicate. And you said that, um, and you said that uh, you're a journalism student. What, um, why do you continue to um, 
believe in, you know, uh, honest journalists and things like that. Why do you continue to do what you do? Um, journalism is becoming more and more important. Well, it's always been very important, but it's changing and it's still very important. Uh, we go out and we report to have unbiased um, opinions. So thank you for really joining important. me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Meanwhile, in January, there was a huge anti-Trump protest the day after the inauguration. Let's go to Jordan for that. It was billed as the Women's March on Washington. Locally, both Madison and Milwaukee held smaller versions. Although crowds were still much larger than expected, our reporters covered it from a variety of angles. First, we turn to Jenna Gadish as she focuses on the older generation of women. Madison was the largest protest held at the state capitol. But we spoke with the older generation and they can recall similar events dating back to the 1950s. It reminds me that we're walking backwards instead of forward. It reminds me that we... It's like deja vu. <laughs> it reminds me that we, we now are out here so they could hear us and we are fighting again for our rights. As thousands made their way through the streets, a common theme of respect and equality was present. It reminds me of the 60s, from civil rights, the anti-Vietnam War marches. It's that powerful, it's that big, um, it's that involved, that many people involved and caring and concerned about it, yes. Even the raging grannies made an appearance. for peace, for justice, for equal rights, for the environment. And, and because we're old ladies <laughs> and we dress funny, uh, people tend to pay attention a little bit more than they might if we just ranted, which many of us feel sometimes we'd like to do. Moving forward, we're uncertain if there's going to be a march that will be this big as the one in Madison. But there's one thing for sure, and that's women that have been marching 50 years ago will continue to march for their rights today. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Jenna Gatish. Thank you, Jenna. Although called the Women's March, this protest included people of all ages and sexes. Many families came and brought young children for the first, for young children, for, the, for some youngsters, it might have been their first march. They got to see plenty of signs, chanting, marching, music, and speeches, all stating strong opinions against Trump. Tisia Muzinga caught up with some of those families. What started out as a group chat on Facebook ended up with thousands of people here at the Capitol in Madison. And some of them are children. Families marched down State Street to send President Donald Trump a very personal message. You want American great? Then show us, respect us, change. My son asked me one day, what, what's a feminist mom? And I said, well, do you believe that women should have the same rights as men? He said, yeah. I said, well, then you're a feminist. And that's what I hope that they take away from this, that everyone in the world is equal. They say women's rights are human rights. And if there's one thing that makes the world go around, it's love. Do, how much love do we need? So much. So much. <laughs> Organizers say that this may be the biggest public demonstration Madison has ever had since 2011. Almost 100,000 people marched against President Donald Trump. In Madison, I'm T.C. Muzinga for Media Milwaukee. Thank you, T.C. And then there were millennials. In some ways, they were leading the charge on this march through social media. The organizer was also a UWM student. Young people were a vocal group during the election cycle, and they showed up in force at the Women's March on Madison. Stefan Stojanovic has the story. It's the day after Inauguration Day in Madison, and the Library Mall on the University of Wisconsin campus is starting to fill with the color pink for the Women's March on Madison. The Madison March took place alongside marches in other cities around the country. Organizers called it a human rights march in the wake of President Trump's election. Take Chelsea Miller, a UWM student and the initial organizer of the march. She said it was her mother who helped her get involved politically. She got me into political activism really early when John Kerry was running for president. I was phone banking for him during the Act 10 protest. I was phone banking, canvassing. I even signed up to be a special registration deputy so I could get people signed up to vote. 
Um, just my parents. It's just kind of always been a big thing in our house. The event set off around noon and marched down State Street to the state capitol. The march featured people across all age groups, including millennials. We spoke to some millennials who had some issues on their minds at the march. I care about education and women's health care and um, just equality. <laughs> the one I care about the most is like climate change issues and the fact that like many of us cabinet members don't even believe like it's a hoax, which is just crazy because without the earth, like they won't even be alive. And it's just like, how do you, I think everyone needs to care because it matters. Just like everyone being treated equally is like the big thing here for me. That as well as um, equal pay is really important to me. It's nearing 3 o'clock and the event is continuing behind me. Madison police estimate that there were 75 to 100,000 people at this march. In Madison for Media Milwaukee, I'm Stevan Stojanovic. And we have Stevan live in the studio with Emily. Emily? Thanks for joining us. No problem. So, um, first I'm curious, why did you decide to report on the Women's March? Um, this whole, the, all the three packages you just saw was kind of coordinated by our, our instructor once again. It's kind of a, um, you know, it's a big demonstration, obviously, and it's taking place at a very important location, such as the state capitol. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a number of these protests happening um, across the nation. Um, they kind of dubbed it Women's March on Insert City here. So it was kind of a... Um, a project right before the semester started for some of the students. Okay, and um, w how was the atmosphere in Madison? Um, I would say the crowd was kind of buzzing with you know excitement. It was very fuel fueled, uh, passionate, uh, demonstrating. Um, lots of music was being played. You had drum beats, all sorts of exciting stuff, and you could see the entire crowd from the top of the state capitol steps all the way down State Street mm -hmm. where um, the march took place from the UW mm -hmm. campus and it was just very just um, as the report my report said there was almost 75 to 100,000 people there so you wow. can imagine the crowd just going down the street. That's awesome. Um, were the protesters willing to talk to you? Oh yeah. Um, I in my report I don't think I had anyone I can't recall anyone that said no but they seem to have a lot to say with the mm -hmm. issues that were on their minds um, and you kind of saw, saw some uh, some that were similar and things like that. That's awesome. Did you notice a lot of uh, UWM students particularly? Um, I didn't pay attention to whether the people I interviewed were uh, students or not. I just uh, saw observed people who looked like they were of the millennial generation and just kind of asked them what issues were um, on their mind because, um, you know, there's certain traits that yeah. millennials talk about when it comes to and issues when it comes to election, and I just wanted to see what, uh, okay, because cool. there's such a special group of people. Well, thank you for joining us, Evan. No problem. Thank you for having me. Now over to Naomi for a look at how people have been feeling in this week since the election. In the span of his first two weeks, President Trump's administration has faced many controversies surrounding his executive orders on cabinet picks. Reporters Sabrina Jenkins and Louise De Leon met with UWM students in and around the union to discuss opinions. Ten months ago, back in April of 2016, Donald Trump stood in this very building at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to speak with the community about his agenda if elected as the 45th President of the United States. Now, only two weeks into his term, with 18 executive orders signed, we speak with students about their emotions and opinions of President Trump. He acts like a child on the internet, and if he would just take one simple step in what he's doing, he could save himself from so many things, and he could make himself slowly look like a president, and maybe try. But he feels the need to just be like, oh, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, and I'm just going to make everybody upset because he just doesn't care. He's doing what the people who have money are telling him to do, and he only cares about his interests, like his band, he picked all the countries or whatever, that he doesn't have any involvements with his company and his businesses. He dipped, he like picked around it just to save his money. He's corrupt. We need Bernie. It's been a long, dark, cold two weeks, and I'm concerned. 
According to the latest polls by CNN, President Trump has a disapproval rating of 53%, the highest of any new president ever polled. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Sabrina Johnson. President Donald Trump has been president now for 13 days, and we are here in the basement of the UWM Union, where the rec center, a place normally for relaxation and taking your mind off things, is now filled with consistent conversation about what his presidency has been like for the first few weeks. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. We have no choice. There are a lot of things he's done. I am very kind of just like disgusted by it. The, the band being kind of one of those. Well, he's a businessman, so he's going to bring money to us. You know, he's going to help us get a lot, of money, a lot more money. But rather than that, we'll just see how it goes. We survived Reagan. We survived Bush. So far, Trump's presidency has been filled with executive orders and powerful decisions. Although the goal is to have change in America, here in the UWM Rec Center, there isn't much change as the relaxing atmosphere filled with pool, video games, and other sorts of fun things like bowling will stay the same. For Media Milwaukee, I'm Luis DeLeon. Thank you, Sabrina and Luis. There was also a more recent protest. For that, let's go back to Emily and Jordan. Last week was International Women's Day. It commemorates the struggle for women's rights and dates back to 1909. MET's producers Nick Harvey and Reggie Adams have more on this story. So the fight for 15 has been around for four years. And when this campaign first started, people looked with recent shifts in presidential power and policies, many citizens are expressing their concerns. Women in particular are vocalizing their concerns on issues relating to their rights on March 8th at a local rally held on Wednesday. Today is about all these women and men coming together to express um, women's rights and to talk about what's important to us. I think it's about coming together as a community. It's about showing our support for all people, regardless if they are um, regardless of what their identities are, how much privilege they have, um, if they have minority identities, um, coming together as a community. This rally wasn't just about women's rights, but it was also about the unification and empowerment of women, despite their backgrounds. We want to empower people to come out and talk about these issues. We want to make sure they know that people care about these things and, you know, show that it isn't some fringe group, you know, feminism is staying around for a long time. I hope it empowers people to come out. I hope it encourages people to not be afraid of the word feminism and also realize that feminism, you know, there's a lot of people here for women's rights, but there's also people here for, you know, fair wages and labor rights and all sorts of different issues. Feminism is not just that anymore. So this rally, you know, I hope it brings attention to all of these issues. United. Women of all backgrounds are bringing awareness to their fears, no matter their race or beliefs. I'm, I'm worried for a lot of reasons. I'm worried not only because I identify as a woman, but I, like Jeremy said, I'm also really worried because I know that there are a lot of people who don't have the same privileges that I do. Um, and I'm really worried what's going to become of us as a country if we don't speak up, if we don't say something, if we don't have rallies like this. The impact that the Trump administration and its policies have had is felt within the many student bodies across the nation. I grew up, I have a pretty diverse group of friends. I have friends who are trans and I have friends who are gay. And I feel like being in such a diverse group, especially at UW Milwaukee, the campus that we go to, is you can see how Trump's administration is already affecting our friends. You can see how Trump administration is already affecting our community and then especially the young people in our community, the younger people who are in middle school and grade school and they're afraid and they're fearful and you don't want to have to explain to a little kid about why they don't have to be afraid when you're afraid yourself. Through these rallies, hopefully more women are empowered to stand up for what they believe is just. MET's producers Sierra and Matt explored a few more opinions on how people's lives have been affected since Trump took office. Let's take a final look at today's last story. Around seven weeks ago, Donald Trump was inaugurated as the 45th President of the United States. Since then, many changes have occurred, ultimately resulting in a mixture of opinions. 
First, we asked a member of the Republican Party why Donald Trump wanted to become president of the United States. Well, I think Donald Trump wanted to become president for a number of different reasons. I think uh, it's true to his campaign slogan, making America great again. And what does that mean? It means economic growth. Uh, he wants to increase the GDP to like 4% growth. Uh, it's about repealing Obamacare. It's about uh, better educational systems. Yeah, it's about uh, keeping our borders safe and our and, and safety in our streets. He wants to help be the solution to that problem. I think one of the things about Donald Trump uh, is that he's good to his uh, his word and his campaign pledges. Uh, one of the things that come to mind is a, uh, a repeal of Obamacare is starting to happen. The uh, immigration ban is part of his uh, policy that he set forth in his campaign. Uh, also educational reform. Also the war against coal is no longer happening. Uh, the West Virginia and Kentucky and Pennsylvania coal miners will have a job in the, uh, for a foreseeable future. Uh, so there's many things that he's done uh, in his first six weeks. Immigration has been a big topic recently in Trump's presidency. Some view anti-immigration as un-American while others view it as a way to keep America safe. I think the immigration ban goes back to his uh, campaign pledge to keep America safe. And to that point, the six countries affected by the ban have no uh, relations or no government in which our government can talk to them about the people that are coming to this country. Since 2001, there's been 50 terrorist attacks on the United States. Many of those terrorists came from those six countries. It's only reasonable that, a, that a, any nation uh, has the authority to control who enters their country. So it's just common sense why he has done it. There's a problem with safety. They're coming from areas that are unsafe, and uh, President Obama classified those six countries uh, previously. So it's really uh, carrying over, to some extent, a policy that President Obama started. President Trump might have an effect on some of the students here at MATC. Since the election, many students have felt uncertain about the future. Well, I think uh, Trump's presidency could affect a lot of uh, students who are currently under DACA in a few different ways. Um, DACA is uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So for uh, um, students who were brought here as young children by their parents, enter the country illegally, um, DACA under President Obama gave them the opportunity to, to work and stay here um, and be protected from being deported. A lot of uh, students like myself were able to get a driver's license, were able to travel to different parts of the country. And now with uh, President Trump, it's unclear whether he will renew or continue DACA or if he will get rid of it. How he you know, introduced himself uh, into politics and how he launched his campaign sent a lot of people um, you know, it, it be, people became nervous as to what Trump will do to immigrants and what will happen to DACA as the program. So, so far, there hasn't been anything um, released. Only, you know, during some interviews, he said that it's a hard uh, subject for him to, to respond to uh, because he, he does have a heart and he does want to treat people fairly, but he hasn't said what he will do. Some people are saying that the information that we provide to the government may now be used against us to deport us, um, but we really don't have any idea right now as to what will happen. MATC has taken a step to help students that may be affected by Trump's presidency. A few months ago, after Trump won, there was an event um, organized by MATC and by the teachers' unions of MATC. Um, they, they declared the campus a sanctuary campus. So basically they're just saying, you know what, we're going to use the resources that we have and uh, protect our students. We want them to feel welcome. We don't want them to think that they're going to you know, show up at school and immigration will be here to deport them. Um, so I, I do think it's important that the school and, and other uh, college campuses come out and declare themselves as, as a place where students uh, from all backgrounds can feel safe, whether um, they're here undocumented or, or they're immigrants from, from other parts of the, of the world. Um, right now, a lot of immigrants are feeling um, unwelcome in a lot of different areas. So I think um, school um, being so important for people's education um, should be a place where, where no one should really feel unwelcome.
Despite the mixed opinions of the American people, we can only hope Trump proves himself as a trustworthy leader through the remainder of his presidency. Thanks to Nick and Reggie, as well as Matt and Sarah, for those reports. Our time is coming to a close, but we want to thank everyone involved in this production. That includes Milwaukee Area Technical College and the Journalism, Advertising, and Media Studies Department at UWM. This has been a joint collaboration looking back on Donald Trump's rise to victory and the public reactions afterwards. Thank you for watching. I'm Jordan Gazarowski. I'm Emily Gallagher-Schmitz. And I'm Naomi Wilson. We hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching.